launched the days with a prolific entrepreneur investor who founded one of the earliest homegrown companies to capitalize on Asia's first and largest intergenerational transfer of wealth. But more than that, she's using the lessons learned to build a business to hopefully last a century. I've traded global financial markets and advised some of Asia's wealthiest for more than 20 years. Yet, I'm constantly in search of new perspectives on finance, business, and of course, life. So I booked tables and put wine on my tab just to bring you some food for thought. Nestled within the UNESCO heritage site of Singapore's Botanic Gardens, this lush restaurant infuses the culinary tradition of Southeast Asia with European inflections. Hi! Hi, hi Shirley! In 2012, Shirley founded Golden Equator Wealth, one of the first homegrown multifamily offices in Singapore. Today, she's helping ultra-high net worth families in 12 countries grow and preserve wealth over generations. This is from Hospice de Bon. I thought this would be a very meaningful bottle of wine for us to enjoy. In the 1400s, there was a lot of uh, natural disaster during that period of time. I see. So the Duke of Burgundy started a hospice to help the poor people there. He started to have different people donating their land and vineyard to the cause. And they've been selling the wine at the auction. After more than 500 years, it's now one of the most known wine auction in the world where the donation and the proceeds goes into supporting the hospice projects and the inhabitants uh, in, the, in the village. So I think it's very meaningful it to is. support and I love the story behind how they keep it so sustainable for so Over many... Over the generations yes, as well. Yes, correct. Okay. Cheers, let's enjoy Cheers. the wine. I'm a big advocate for long-term thinking, long-term planning, but more importantly, the mindset in terms of how we are managing uh, policies, how we are managing our businesses, uh, how we are managing our families as well. Running a multifamily office for the last uh, 10 years, I get to learn and understand a lot more about how the uh, European families are run and how our Asian families are run. And the distinct difference is in terms of generational thinking. In Singapore, we have three banks that is groomed locally, two already institutionalized. UOB is currently still run by family, but we're unsure whether there's a format that it will actually continue in their next third of fourth generation. We don't have a lot of examples, unlike some of the Western world. What are the examples you can think of right, of very successful um, families from the West yeah. and the lessons we can learn from them? The first lesson that I, I've learned for sure is nothing is just random. European families are very experienced, the large ones. A lot of things is like deliberate, and well planned and they have documented down that it should be run in a certain way and that's why they can run businesses for generations they can run their families for generations take for example some of the european banks after eighth or ninth generation it's still the family running it they plan ahead from for example how many children i'm gonna have versus the asian thinking that oh Maybe like the more children that I have, the more I'm protected of certain risks, which may or may not be true. They get involved in global initiatives and global community. I know of some families that are contributors to WHO or some of the large organizations around healthcare, legal, finance, so that when a pandemic like this happens, they are the first to get the information. This is really long-term thinking because it's having the foresight to build good relationships years back. 
In the next few decades, the largest ever intergenerational wealth transfer is happening across the globe. By 2030, 15 trillion US dollars is expected to pass to younger generations globally. In Asia, this is happening for the first time and is estimated at 2.1 trillion US dollars. However, out of the families who have succession plans, less than half in Asia Pacific have been formalized. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Botanico. Thank you. Thank you. This is your smoke origin, served with shrimp paste jam. And this is our Asam Nasa Serviche. It's a serviche of sea bass fish, topped with the shrimp paste ice cream and encouraged to mix everything together. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A lot of the wealth in Asia is still very new. 85% of all the wealth is still with the main founder, meaning the, the first generation. Yeah. And we're only starting to see the, the trickle of wealth transfers happening. I think the movement will be uh, still very, very muted and uh, slow. There's a lot of struggle as how best to do it. And it comes with the baggage of culture. Conversations still cannot happen openly with, uh, between generations. My sense is like the patriarchs still want to have absolute control yeah. about how things are run, yeah. about investment. And I think that sort of put a yeah. bit of a spanner because yeah. they are very much uh, set in their ways. Asian families, it's quite random how they bring their next generation into the business. So it's like, okay, I'm going to get my son to take care of this part of the business. Or I'm going to get my daughter to manage the family office uh, finance. And the paycheck may think that, okay, I'll throw them into the deep sea to learn and they'll pick things up a lot faster because they have learned it that way. I think there's opportunity to accelerate it and organize it a lot better between the two generations. It's not about eliminating the difficulty, it's about how best to, to support them to deal with those difficulties. For a century, the concept of the family office was limited to a small number of families. It wasn't until the 1980s that family offices started to multiply, first in the United States, then elsewhere. Family offices provide a broad spectrum of services, including private wealth management, family governance, and succession planning for family businesses. This must be considered in a broader context of individual members' desires, family perceptions, as well as the macroeconomic conditions and regulatory landscape. We create the platform, the environment that's suitable for them to progress into that kind of uh, generational thinking format. I'll give you an example. Recently, I set up uh, the CEO office so that I can institutionalize the company. We have legal expertise, talent around investment, ad hoc talent, so that when the next generation comes into some of the business, they are not just thrown into the deep sea. They feel well supported and they know how to function on the get-go with the talent that they have. I see that as extremely important for business continuity. That's why like the president of the United States, their, yeah. their presidential office is, is well set up. The moment a crisis happens to the president, anyone who takes over needs to be prepared and ready to take on the responsibility to manage the whole country. Asia is home to 36% of the world's billionaire population and 22% of the world's ultra-high net worth individuals. Among the popular locations for family offices, Singapore has seen a five-fold increase between 2017 and 2019. So I think with the growth of family offices around the region, right? Mm. how much of a pie is left? We're probably at the first decade uh, of where private banks were 35, 40 years ago. Definitely, there is a lot of uh, improvement to be done. Singapore is not there as having one of the top asset management companies. So consolidation definitely needs to happen to benefit Singapore better as a whole, whether it's from asset management to family offices, so that we can build bigger, stronger brands that can be trusted globally.
So, do you come from a next gen or did you always think that you're going to be doing finance? I fell into finance in a way, mm. right? I began my career at Goldman um, mm. at a very young age. Um, and my next role was actually at Lehman Brothers, right? Mm. So actually, I went through the whole um, financial crisis mm. uh, with Lehman. As you can imagine, it's quite a harrowing experience. Because you never thought that um, an investment bank of that size uh, could actually go under, mm. go get bankrupt over mm. a weekend, essentially. Right? Mm. So I think that was one of the most, um, you know, surreal moments of my life. I have to rethink about what life is about, uh, especially in, in my career in banking. And also, I think that's when you also decided to do something different with your mm-hmm. career. Um, I worked for a good, you know, close to a decade in the financial industry. So in the banks, uh, previously, it's really about engaging the client with what kind of products, uh, how the products will look like, how they should be educated with the products and the variety of the products. So it's very, very focused around products and what they can do with it. Shortly after the crisis, I thought about the gaps and how underserved the wealthy really are in this part of the world. They need to plan a lot better and uh, they need to understand what are their options. The philosophy of running a family office is formulated very differently from like a fund management company yes. or a private bank kind of thinking. The philosophy has to be very much centred around how you're really thinking on the side of the family and the dedication and depth in uh, wanting to build that long relationship and not only care about the uh, short-term, every-year-on-year kind of uh, benefits. After over a decade of building and preserving wealth for Asia's ultra-high net worth families, Shirley is applying lessons learned to building a business for the long term. You know, we all invest in startups, and then one of the key common questions is what is your USP, right? Yes. What sets us apart, right? Is number one, learnings dealing with families. One thing that I would learn from Western families is this. We should speak a lot more. We should speak up a lot more. We should speak about issues a lot more. And we should talk about it even if it means that there's no clear solution to it immediately. It applies to how we run our organisation as well. Next year, we celebrate our 10-year anniversary. And our first few key employees, we discussed this, and it was very clear that they want me to be the main and key decision maker. When families do not put those clear lines from the beginning and address the difficult conversations from the beginning, it becomes even more difficult later on. We have this philosophy, we always should learn from young people. Now, we have this program called On Millennial and X. We get uh, the employees to form into groups of four and five. So they will teach the leadership team. Leadership team, especially when they are in their 50s or even your 40s, it gets even more difficult to unlearn because we think that we've accumulated a lot of experience and we know a lot of things. But we must have an open mindset to hear what they are saying, so that we can make better decisions for the future. Just like the families as well, when you have a purpose and a goal that is set out very clearly, it gives people better structure and guidance in following that purpose. One of our key motto is the future together. We always think about the future. What will be the future trends? What are the mega trends that's going to be out there? So with noticing all these trends, then how do we create businesses and build connections and build ecosystem around each trend? When an ecosystem is built, every single element is important for it to thrive. If there is no um, investors coming in, no matter how strong your startups are, they're just not supported. Yeah, if there's no continuous learning for them, they may be stuck at their issues. You mentioned ecosystem a lot of times, mm. but statistics, however, show that mm. 70 to 80% of partnerships mm. don't work out, right? Mm. 
So how have you designed your ecosystem, your partnerships yeah. to make sure that mm. you know people stay on track? Partnerships and collaborations are very different. Collaboration is more like a project collaboration, right? Let's say we we place our skill sets and our resources into collaborating into something, mm -hmm. and we see whether there's a good outcome. When you have partnerships, there is a lot of mutual benefits that needs to happen in the long run. Partnership has to be coupled with clear contracts, spelling out the terms, who takes on what responsibilities, how would the commercial terms and ownership look like, and then what is the outcome and goal each one care about, and what's the goal that we will eventually reach together. This helps us eliminate a lot of partnership issues. From a family office in 2012, Shirley has grown Golden Equator into an ecosystem of seven synergistic companies, comprising a multi-family office, business consultancy, investment management, and education. To nourish the ecosystem, she built a regional community by setting up curated workspaces that bring high-powered businesses, investors, and experts under one roof. Today, she's looking to expand the group's reach by tapping into the unlikely markets of Brunei and Kazakhstan. Hello, sorry Hi. to interrupt. Thank you. So I'm serving your main course. It's the abacus artichokes with the fried kale and sunshok puree. Mm. Oh, okay. This is uh, one of our famous selections of our vegetarian main course here. Thank you. Yeah, All thank right, you. enjoy. Mm, there are always more interesting markets, bigger yeah. markets like China, mm. like Vietnam, and yeah. even India, right? Yeah. Where we can see wealth creation happening at a much faster pace. Yeah. So why why Kazakhstan? It's a great question because we don't make our decision based on. Uh, stats on where the best opportunity is. Because where the best opportunity is may not be where you do best in. You can't go to China and hope to do really well, especially now where it's so, so competitive. So with some of our markets that's, that, that we go into, first we identify that we have in-market and local connects. Yeah, and that's very important because when we go into a new territory, uh, it's always good to do partnerships. Yes. Second, we feel that we can serve them better in our different business areas uh, and they're underserved currently. So when we went into Brunei three years ago, we really tried to understand the market, what is their priorities and how do we fulfill those priorities. The second one that we're looking at is Central Asia region, Kazakhstan being one of the first. We're looking at the potential for investments into infrastructure in the country. We're looking at the potential of the wealth that is being managed around the region that is actually very underserved and looking at it with a bit of a longer term perspective as well. This is another thing that I always tell uh, some of our employees. The relationships that you make today you cannot expect that it will bear fruits immediately. The relationships that we make today is for a few years later, yes. which is why deepening the relationship in underserved market is important. Because you're the first to be there, once you start and build the relationship, the relationship will be very strong and very hard to break. Serving a dessert. This is the bread glutinous rice with toasted rice ice cream and coconut as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've seen some of your interviews and I think you described Golden Equator as right, you're a very special stage of growth. Yes. You are not a young company, mm. but you also you are not a very old company. Where do you see Golden Equator mm. 30 mm. years down the road? We built very good foundation. The 2.0 business is really uh, looking forward into how we can accelerate at great speed so that we can now provide services not only to your institutions, to your families, we are also going to be providing services to the mass public. And there are three identified uh, underserved markets that we see, especially on the finance front. So women is one of them. 
We have been continuously trying to work towards getting more women into the workforce, more diversity, more representation, more access to capital, which would have a positive effect on economy. With more women coming into the workforce, we'll probably see trillions of uh, GDP being created. The stats we, we both know very well is like very few women-led uh, startups receive funding from yes. VCs or venture capital funds. And I think even less VCs are actually uh, female-founded. Right? Yeah. Do you have other views for how women can get better access to capital? The stats for uh, women entrepreneur has increased but not in proportion to the funding yes. going to female entrepreneurs. That's right. So while we see more female coming up and stepping up to want to you know, start small businesses, uh, we do not see the funding moving as aggressively. So I think that's something that we want to work towards. The next underserved market that we see, so your next generation of young people, young people see financial products differently how they're going to utilise uh, lending or place their savings will also look very different. And we definitely will go into that kind of space. And then the third category that we see that's up and rising is really your freelance and creative economy. It's a special group, especially with pandemic. We're going to make it easy for them to access. Technology and capital is a full ecosystem to be more self-sufficient. Yes. By combining strong business acumen with the values and practices of the world's most successful families, Shirley is building a business on deep, meaningful relationships with a long-term view. I really do hope that we can be one of those organisations that is born out of Singapore and we can build a multi-decade, century-long business. To hear Shirley's elevator pitch to Japanese billionaire and serial entrepreneur Taiso Sun, Tune in to the Lunch with Masters of Finance podcast on channelnewsasia.com slash listen.